Colloquy of Marburg. And it was fascinating. Luther and some of his guys got together with um, Zwingli and some of his guys, and they said, let's talk theology and see if we really agree on things. And so they talked about their theology of the scriptures, they talked about their theology of God, they talked about their theology about Jesus Christ, they talked about their theology of, of salvation, they talked about their theology of this, they talked about their theology of that, and I tell you, it was all just down the line, and you can imagine how excited they were to determine, to, to, to discover, listen, we, we come from totally different backgrounds, you come from Switzerland, I come from Germany, we didn't really influence one another, but we seem to believe the same things, you'd think we'd been reading the same Bible, praise the Lord. And it all came along just wonderfully until sort of late in the colloquy, late in the meetings together, there they are sitting together at tables, and it said, you know, that they sat at tables, and there were velvet tablecloths on the tables. And um, Luther says, well, what do you think about the Lord's Supper? And, and Zwingli says, oh, we really value the Lord's Supper. He goes, the, the, the bread and the wine are a beautiful representation of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And Luther said, what would you say? And, and Zwingli said, well, representation of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And Luther said, representation? What are you talking about? He said, Jesus said, this is my body. He, he said, the, the, the bread and the wine are the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now listen, to be fair to Luther, Luther did not believe in the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. But what he did believe, a doctrine known as consubstantiation, is not far from it, right? Basically, Luther believed that the bread and the wine in communion were more than just representations. It's actually a very technical um, argument that gets into the whole philosophical idea of the nature of reality. But suffice it to say that Luther's position on what the bread and the cup were was actually much closer to the Roman Catholic position than Zwingli's was, and Luther took great offense. It is said that, that Luther kept writing in the velvet of the tablecloth right in front of him, you know, this is my body, this is my body, because that's what he felt. He felt Listen, how can you say it's just a representation when, when, when the Bible says, Jesus said, this is my body? As a matter of fact, Luther was so outraged by this one particular point of disagreement between him and Zwingli that he angrily said of Zwingli, you are of another spirit, just because of this one disagreement. Again, it shows you the kind of guy Martin Luther was, right? Um, an amazing, amazing man, but given to these fits of kind of passion and, and anger and outbursts. Well, one thing you should know about this, though, is many years later, somebody brought before Luther um, John Calvin's writings on what the nature of the bread and wine were in communion. And Calvin's point was almost identical to Zwingli's. Luther looked over what Calvin wrote and he said, yeah, it looks okay to me. So who knows if it was the passion of the moment or if Luther mellowed in his older age, I can't really say, but the colloquy of Marburg was a big deal. Well, sad to say, Zwingli was killed in battle, actually. He was killed in battle against Roman Catholic armies serving as a chaplain to the Protestant militia. In our minds, it's kind of hard to understand this or comprehend it. But, you know, when you had some princes and some regions that were becoming Protestant and other regions that were becoming Catholic, it wasn't long until you had actual military battles between Catholic forces and Protestant forces. In the early days, it was usually by Catholic forces trying by force to reclaim areas of Europe for, for Catholicism. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the Thirty Years' War. So enough with Zwingli. Now we want to talk about another aspect of the Reformation outside of Germany, and that would be in the person of John Calvin. Um, we remember that Calvin was a second-generation reformer. He built upon the structure that Luther and Zwingli and others had established. I mean, after all, Calvin was born almost 20, 25 years after Luther and Zwingli. He was born in the year 1509, and he died in the year 1564. 
And so he built upon the foundation of Luther and Zwingli. You can say that Calvin was a Lutheran, or maybe you could say that Luther was a Calvinist. You could say that Luther argued more strongly for the doctrines of predestination and the depravity of man than even Calvin did. Calvin's interest in the matters of predestination it seems, when you read his institute, to be primarily pastoral. He presented those doctrines in many ways as a way to comfort the believer who has doubts you know, about his own salvation. Luther's hold on these doctrines was more a matter of theological debate. The other thing we should remember about Calvin is that he was not really an original thinker. Instead, he was a great organizer and a good writer. He was also a devoted pastor. Most people think of Calvin as being a very dour man, somber, sour, never happy. This doesn't seem to be a reliable historical picture of him, but neither was he the guy given to the real big fits of merriment and laughter that Luther was. You know, you could just imagine what it would have been like to have Luther and Calvin in the same room together. You know, Luther, the hard-drinking, happy German, you know. Luther, the kind of guy who said that it's impossible for a man to do good theology without beer in his hand. You know, him next to Calvin, who was a much more stern kind of guy. Um, and so he probably wasn't as somber and stern as people made him out to be. But yet, definitely, he was that compared to Luther. Um, Calvin had a very interesting early life and conversion. Um, he was the second of five sons, and his father worked for the Bishop of Noyes in France. Uh, though Through his father's influence, he was appointed to two ecclesiastical offices, and he drew an income from them. Uh, remember how I told you that each church office would sort of have an income associated with it? Well, his father was able to finagle it to where Calvin had two ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical offices, and this basically funded his scholarship. You, you know how it worked. Basically, Calvin was hired to be the priest over two different parishes. Okay? Well, Calvin didn't want to waste his time doing that. He wasn't even ordained as a priest, I think. I'm not sure, but I don't think he was even ordained as a priest. So Calvin said, forget this, I'll hire a couple of chumps, basically, to do the work of pastoring those small parish churches for me. I'll give them just a bit of the money that I get for it, and I'll live on the rest. And that's basically how he funded his education and his early life. He went to university and he studied some theology, uh, both in Paris and in Orleans. Uh, in the beginning, it looked like he might become a priest, but then he studied more law than he did theology. Uh, we don't know the details of his conversion, but at university in both Paris and Orleans, he had many Protestant friends and associates. And it seems that their influence eventually brought him to an understanding and even an embrace of the gospel and Protestant ideas. Well, because he was a young man with such a good mind and such outstanding intellectual ability, uh, he soon became one of the leaders of the Protestant movement within Paris. Well, Calvin was a very outspoken leader of the Protestant movement in Paris. Not that he was the only one, but he was among the leadership. And his strong calls for reform of the Roman Catholic Church in France, along the same lines as what had happened in Luther's Germany, caused a very strong reaction. And, and Calvin and a couple of companions had to flee from Paris for their own safety. Basically, they were run out of town. He, he also, at this time, resigned his ecclesiastical offices in Neues. Um, this illustrates the idea that Calvin was not really a lion like Luther was. Now, I don't mean to imply that Calvin was a coward. No, not at all. He just had a different kind of courage than Luther did. Luther seemed to enjoy conflict. Uh, Calvin didn't. Calvin was essentially a bookish man. He pretty much wanted to be left alone with his books to pursue his scholarly ambitions and his writings. He didn't want to be out in the forefront sort of fighting the battle the way that Luther did. 
Well, uh, because he was run out of Paris, he kind of had to move from place to place to avoid persecution, and he continued writing. In the year 1536, when he was only 27 years old, he published his first edition of the Institutes. Now, I don't know how old you guys are, but I don't know if you'll be able to accomplish something like this by the time you're 27 years old. I certainly know that I never did by the time I was 27. Uh, This, especially in its future editions, would be Calvin's great work, and it showed his ability especially to explain and organize doctrine. You know, you can really say that in some ways Luther broke new ground, right? Luther really did some radical things that, that weren't new biblically, but they were new in his culture. Calvin really didn't do those new things. But what Calvin had a genius for was for organizing and explaining. And uh, this is really seen very evidently in Calvin's Institutes. Well, he was forced to travel from place to place because of the persecution. He, He went to Strasbourg and then he came to Geneva. He came to Geneva and intended to stay for only one night But the man who was the leader of the Reformation Protestant movement in Geneva, which really had only barely become sort of a Protestant city, the the man who was the leader was a man named uh, Farrell. And Farrell was a fiery man. Uh, His emblem illustrated a, a man holding a sword with two hands, and it was a flaming sword. They called it the sword of the true word. You can imagine the kind of man who would take this as his sort of insignia. He was a fiery man. And when Farrell heard that Calvin was spending the night in Geneva, Calvin, the famous teacher and writer, he said, I gotta see this guy. And so he went to his room and Farrell spoke with Calvin and he demanded that Calvin stay in Geneva and take leadership with him of the Protestant cause in the city. Calvin said, no way, man. You know, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be bound to one place. I'm a scholar. I'm a writer. You know what Farrell did? Farrell threatened him with the curse of God if he didn't do it. With great fear, Calvin agreed. He said, okay, I'll stay. Well, at first, it didn't go very well. Farrell and Calvin worked together to transform a city after a godly Protestant ideal, but they were strongly opposed. You see, they were basically run out of town in a short time. Geneva was officially Protestant, but it was not a godly or an ordered place at all, and it had a reputation around Europe for being a very immoral city. And they just didn't want the godly leadership and reform of Farrell and Calvin. So they pushed them out of town. Calvin went back to Strasbourg. Calvin was very happy in Strasbourg. But something drew him back to Geneva. It could very well have been that the Protestant cause in Geneva was threatened. There were real movements by the Roman Catholics to reclaim it as a Roman Catholic city. And maybe it was that Calvin just felt this obligation that said, I've got to go back and make a stand. It's my duty to do it. But he was drawn back to Geneva. And basically, Calvin returned to Geneva and through his hard work, through his strong arguments and through lots of political and what we would call police pressure, he's transformed the city from a reputation for immorality to a reputation of outstanding godliness. Geneva became a magnet for Protestants from all over Europe. They came there and they were influenced and they went back to their native lands. This was especially true for English Protestants who were escaping persecution. But because of this very radical transformation of the society, it brought Calvin into a lot of of uh, controversy. You see, Calvin didn't go to Geneva just to be a scholar and just to be a Bible teacher, but he went there literally to transform this wicked city. And so when Calvin brought his strong leadership and his somewhat forced transformation of the city, it created a lot of controversy and opposition. He was accused of being a dictator, and this is partially true, but it's wrong to think that Calvin ruled Geneva like a king. He had tremendous influence, but he had to use that influence to persuade the governmental leaders of the city. He usually succeeded, 
But again, it wasn't like he was a king, but yet there's no denying he was a very strong voice, perhaps the dominant voice of Geneva in his day. Uh, for example, Calvin could not only put persuasion and pressure upon the civic leaders of, of Geneva, but he could also shun and refuse communion to those whom he believed to be 